Bonjour à toutes et à tous, bienvenue, welcome back à notre série de podcasts sur l'équité en santé dans le cadre de la pandémie de Covid-19. On avait démarré en novembre avec cinq podcasts et là on continue suite à l'intervention de David Napier, l'anthropologue de la santé euh, euh, du Royaume-Uni, avec Sir Michael Marmot, qui est un épidémiologiste, euh, professeur en santé publique, d'Angleterre également, et qui voulait nous donner une nouvelle perspective sur cette pandémie et sur les inégalités qu'elles peuvent creuser. Et je vais partager euh, ce podcast avec professeur Patrick Bodenman pour combiner nos points de vue sur cette pandémie, moi en tant qu'économiste et lui en tant que clinicien. Je me réjouis de partager ce moment avec vous et démarrons tout de suite. Good afternoon Michael, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you with us today in our Health Equity and COVID-19 podcast. Michael, you are a professor of epidemiology and public health at University College London. You're the director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity. You have led research groups on health inequalities and health equity over 40 years and shared a good number of international commissions, including the WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. So it's a great, great pleasure to have you. And last year in December, you published the COVID-19 Marmot Review, which is a report that aimed at examining inequalities in COVID-19 mortality in England, show the effects not only of the pandemic, but also of the associated responses on health, economic and social inequalities. And you also make recommendations in this report. So maybe to start with, uh, I wanted to come back to the title of, of your report, which is called Build Back Fairer. So why uh, this title was chosen? And maybe this is an opportunity also to share with us your definition of health equity. I called my report Build Back Fairer for three reasons. The first was we said at the beginning of the pandemic that it would expose the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. And so it proved and we documented that. So we're talking about inequalities. Secondly, the situation that we had before the pandemic in Britain was most unacceptable and uh, with great inequalities in health. And thirdly, uh, people, President Biden, Prime Minister Johnson, were talking about Build Back Better. So I wanted to echo that Build Back Better, but emphasize Build Back Fairer, not just some notion of better, but to get equity in there, build back fairer. And so your question, the way we use the term health equity is the systematic inequalities in health between social groups that are judged to be avoidable by reasonable means and are not avoided are unfair, hence inequitable. So I use the term fair, equity, more or less interchangeable. So, but build back equitably sounds a little awkward. Build back fair is simpler. Great, thanks very much, Dave. Michael, early in the report, you say that it would be a tragic mistake to go back to the pre-pandemic situation. Can you elaborate on this point? If I can go back three steps. <laughs> I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, a global commission. I was asked by the then Prime Minister of the UK, how could we apply the findings and recommendations of your global commission to one country, England? And in 2010, we published the Marmot Review, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. In February 2020, we published Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review, 10 years on. And we look back at what had happened. So this is just before the pandemic crashed upon us. And what we saw was that life expectancy had stopped improving at the previous rate. The improvement in life expectancy had almost ground to a halt. The slowdown in life expectancy improvement was more marked in the UK than in any other rich country except Iceland and the United States. Second, 
inequalities in health had increased, and third, life expectancy for people in the poorest areas outside London was going down. This is a terrible situation. If you agree with the conclusion that health tells us something about how well the society is meeting the needs of its members, our society had stopped improving. And the inequities in health tells us that the inequities in society were increasing. So that's where we were before the pandemic. And that's why I say we don't want to go back to the status quo ante. We want to build back fairer. Michael, I wanted to come back maybe to the societal response to contain the pandemic and the impact that is it had on health, social and economic inequalities. And one question, one, one way to put it is the following question. Was the cure sometimes worse than the disease itself, in your opinion? Absolutely not. A total misunderstanding. If you look at, forgive me for this, but like many people, I had an obsession. If you look at what President Trump said in the US, most of the time what he said was who he is, which is racist, divisive, angry, um, terrible. That's most of what he said. Occasionally he would try and be wise. And then he got even worse when he tried to be wise. And one of the things he said was the cure might be worse than the disease. Absolute, complete and utter garbage. There is no trade-off between the public health and the economy. In fact, what the evidence shows, uh, the Financial Times published this, what the evidence shows very clearly is the better the control of the pandemic, the less economic hit there was. The right way to preserve your economy is to protect the public health then you don't have to lock down. So the cure wasn't worse than the d d disease. What you could say was that poor control of the disease was worse for the economy than good control of the disease. So no, the cure wasn't worse than the disease. Bad control of the pandemic um, led to awful social and economic consequences, including increased social and economic inequalities. Thanks very much. We fully agree with you, Michael, and we're happy that you put it so clearly. Another question, Michael, is about the fact that beyond within country inequities, are you today concerned with inequities between countries and regions in this pandemic? On the 31st of March, I published a second report with the title Build Back Fairer. I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health in the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO, North Africa and the Middle East. And that's an extraordinarily interesting and challenging region. It contains some of the richest countries in the world. Um, gross national income per person adjusting for purchasing power of ninety thousand dollars that's even more than switzerland oh, yes. uh, or the united states and countries some of the poorest countries in the world so we have these enormous differences uh, in social and economic circumstances and enormous differences in health that go along with them and the huge inequalities in health between countries. And then within countries, we see the social gradient. The more deprived, the worse the health. So uh, I've been very concerned, and I'm still very concerned, with that region. Prior to that, we published, uh, I led, the Commission on Equity and Health Inequalities in the Americas convened by the Pan American Health Organization. So we were looking at inequalities between and within countries all through the Americas, North America, Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and before that, we did a European review of social determinants and the health divide. So on a daily basis, I'm very much concerned with health inequities within 
England and the United Kingdom, and globally with other countries. So it might be one day I'm giving a lecture in Chile and uh, having a discussion in Geneva, and then talking to people working in local government in England about we can do what we can do locally. Thank you, Michael. And in the report, you made many recommendations, and one of them is that you recommend proportionate universalism in policy approaches and resource allocation. Can you explain this a little bit and maybe provide an example? This was my attempt at classic British compromise. <laughs> that if you, a, a typical Nordic approach to social policy is universalist policies, you include everybody. And that appealed to me because I've documented repeatedly the social gradient in health. It's not simply that poor people have worse health than everybody else, but it's socially graded. The higher your income, the better your health. The more years of education, the better your health. The less deprived the area in which you live, the better your health. It's socially graded. And universalist policies get at the gradient. Then the classic Anglo-Saxon approach to social policy is targeting. We focus on the worst off. And you can see that with immigrants, with homeless, the poor, and so on. So I was trying to marry the two. And that's why I came up with proportionate universalism. And I said, look at the National Health Service. It's a universalist system. It is available to everybody, includes everybody, but effort is proportionate to need. If you've got diabetes and peripheral vascular disease and cardiovascular disease and renal disease, the NHS spends a lot of money on you and rightly so. But as I've joked, if at 95 you were bungee jumping and the rope snapped as you fell to your doom, you wouldn't say, damn, I spent all this money, taxes, paying for the National Health Service, and then I didn't get to use it. You'd <laughs> say, well, it's not a bad way to go, really. The rope snapped at 95. So it's a proportionate universalist service. But then I wanted to define need, not just on the basis of how much illness you have, but degree of deprivation. So I can give you a good example of doing it the wrong way. Over the 10 years from 2010, in the UK, if we look at local government spending by level of deprivation, the more deprived the area, the greater the reduction in spending. So in the least deprived 20% of areas, reduction in spending per person was 16%. And then it went down progressively. And in the most deprived 20% of areas, reduction in spending was 32%. So that's spending inversely proportionate to need. Well, if we reverse that, and got proportionate universalism, we'd say the greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the more the spending should be. You, you make also a series of recommendations uh, about the, the employment and the labor market. And why is that so important in, in a time of pandemic to, to make sure everybody has access to fair employment? Firstly, let's look at who we valued during the pandemic. And let me take the example of workers in adult social care. Now, they were unwittingly spreaders of the virus because conditions for work in care homes are so appalling. Many of the workers in these homes don't have proper employment. They're part of the gig economy. So they were moving from one home to another. And then when you look further, Half do not earn a living wage. These are vital members of our society. The most vulnerable older members of our society depend on their care. And we don't pay them properly. They don't have a proper job structure and employment structure. They don't have 
promotion opportunities, they don't have proper training, and half don't earn a living wage. If we then look more generally, what we saw during the pandemic is the lower the income, the higher the probability that they were people were working in a sector that was shut down. So those of us in higher paid sectors could work from home. Mm -hmm. And the lower your income, the more likely you were in a sector that shut down. And what we realized during the pandemic is who keeps society running? I've talked about care workers, NHS, health workers, but delivery drivers, supermarket checkout clerks, um, trash re refuse collectors, and so on. And they're paid miserably but they keep society going. And if we were in a position to learn from the experience of the pandemic, we would say, OK, we don't want to pay people who collect refuse the same as surgeons. We believe in paying surgeons more than refuse collectors. But we do think refuse collectors should be paid enough money to have a decent life to have a healthy life, to be able to feed their children. And in Britain, at least, more than 50% of the people who are in poverty are in households where at least one adult is working. In other words, we don't pay pe people enough to get them out of poverty. We need to learn that lesson. And we know that that's bad for health. Poor working conditions are bad for health. Not having enough money to have a healthy life is bad for health. Job insecurity is bad for health. Unemployment is bad for health. So fair, decently paid work is one of my six domains of recommendations. Go on, ask me what the other five are. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you, Michael. That was that's really excellent. Maybe can uh, maybe it's not the right word, but can we say that the pandemic was some sort of opportunity to move, you know, the health equity agenda forward? Well, as I said, if we are in a position to learn the lesson, then most definitely. I mean, take the issue. Uh, that in many European countries of austerity after the global financial crisis of 2008, many governments said, ah, we've got to pull back, got to spend less. And Britain certainly did that. Austerity was the major policy priority for the government that was elected in 2010. Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, the Conservative government said in Britain, not we've got to pull back. They said, whatever it takes, we will spend whatever it takes. Wow, that's very different. If they really mean that, that's a big change. So it is an opportunity. Let's learn those lessons um, and let's ask ourselves, what does a better, fairer society look like? And let's take the steps to achieve it. Great. This is a, a perfect closing point. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for the excellent, clear, insightful answers. We are really grateful and uh, really happy to share that with our listeners. So thank you very much again. It was a great pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Michael.